These are the confessions of a rugby fixer. It's been one week since my last confession. I am Harry, the rugby fixer. Rugby almost fixed me, or came pretty close. And so I spend the rest of my life as I solve problems for capital, for companies, for institutions, for nonprofits around the world who have failed to solve the human condition and never will, and therefore need someone who knows just the right wrinkle, just the right edge, and which line you can put your foot just across. Just like in rugby, the ambiguity of rugby, where every single engagement or breakdown could generate, if viewed from a different angle, three other penalties. Um, rugby has prepared me for that, and specifically I want to talk about how to play far from home. You're a good rugby team if you can win your matches at home, uh, but you are a great one, or a potential, or a candidate to be a champion if you can go on the road and you can win consistently. With the wrong food, with toilet bowls that feel different, with um, ref with the crowds like the ones in Wales when I played there on a tour once, where someone was literally screaming for someone to rip my leg off uh, and then hit me with a soggy end. That kind of animus, feeding off um, animosity, danger, risk, everything feels a little bit more scary on the road. So the people have gathered statistics and figured this out, but it's, it's worth two to three points in rugby where you are. Um, and so if you're evenly matched, that is almost the ball game. So how can South African teams um, overcome that? It's just doing it more. So you see the Springboks of early times struggling to go overseas and win. And now you see with the Springboks being drawn from and recruited from all around the world, um, there's not that much of a difference. And in fact, the Brocks have become a very good away team. So how do they do that? How did I learn to be able to go to a foreign country and solve a problem without the benefits, without the framework of having the friendly cop, the guy who has an incinerator, um, the language barrier, the slang understanding, the ability to recognize when danger is beckoning you. I'll give you an example. So a lot of Safas that become part of the diaspora go abroad and mine. Mining is deep in the South African soul to look and see what's underneath us, to dig out what is hidden. The loneliness of a mine, I think, appeals to the shy South African. Um, but also, South Africans burn bright and want it. <laughs> they want the gold. So, I have a friend <clears throat> who became a mining mogul in Canada. And uh, he called me up and said, I've got a problem in Honduras. Can you go down there and fix it? And the, and the problem, as I understood it, was that the mine was no longer mining. It was a very rich mine. Uh, just below the cloud forest in Honduras and they had a deal 99 year lease with the government to refine gold to 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 make it happen in a way that Honduras couldn't but it had certain prerequisites and apparently those have been blown because suddenly a mine that was pulling many digits of dollars of gold out was suddenly doing zero so when you go from millions to naught, someone says, call Harry, and so there I was. I was gonna go play an away game. And when I go away and I try to understand it, of course I do some intel, just like a rugby coach will. But you're limited by what you can find out. On the flight down, uh, I did on my phone discover that uh, Honduras was the origin of the Zika virus, the source, that it was the number one, Tegucigalpa was the number one murder capital in the world which was impressive, and I, I, I paid attention to that. Um, also paid attention to the means of death, which was by machete. There was hardly any guns that were on uh, free disposal, which was a comfort to me since I couldn't fire, carry firearms uh, on the plane. Uh, we also discovered that um, many people don't speak Spanish, so even though my fluency in Spanish would be a benefit in most Latin American countries, here, if I was talking to the ref about what happened to the breakdown, it might be in a native Indian tongue. I also learned that uh, it is one of those places where the distinction between the law, the authorities, the cartels, the local governments, 
and the outlaws is uh, ambiguous. So just up my alley as a rugby man. I try to go very light when I go abroad. I don't want to make a big uh, impression upon arrival. If you have security details and you know three SUVs blacked out in a row and you're wearing shades and a, a suit with an unbuttoned shirt and you briskly are, uh, your bags are taken from, from you by burly bodyguards, all the danger is right there in front of you and around you. All those guys can turn on you in a second. Plus you're an attractive nuisance. So I just arrive with a small backpack, black t-shirt, jeans, felt schooner, uh, a phone over here and a phone over there, a stash of cash over here, a stash of cash over there. And uh, identities that could provide for me to be from various places. Um, and then I try to learn. I try to soak it in. I don't try to assume or pre have predispositions either way or suppositions either way. I just wanted to understand why is the gold mine not producing. So my try, the try line was make the gold mine produce again. So first night was a cold one uh, for someone who had a black t-shirt. So, you know, always try to understand the weather conditions. It was cold up there. So uh, my guide and I, Weicho and I made a fire and he uh, launched into all kinds of suppositions. It was almost like a coach's meeting where Weicho was saying all the what ifs that I didn't want to think about. Um, you know, what, what went wrong? Why is the mine closed? Why is the HR incommunicado? Why is, why is there no lieutenants? So where is everyone? What is this ground? Um, I remember playing a match one time in the mountains uh, and it was cold and it was near Elgin. And I was a little boy and I remember that getting stuck in the bottom of some of those moving loose scrums as we used to call it. Uh, I felt like I was, my face was buried in the mud. The mud had sort of, what's it called, transmogrified, where a thing becomes another thing. Like I was being forced unholy communion of mud, which tasted and smelled like applesauce in my mouth. It's like I have a lifelong aversion now to any form of apples, which is uh, rendered into a sauce. Even though I love apples, there's nothing I love more than apples. But there's something about that kind of substance that reminded me of being beaten on the road uh, nothing you could do about it. Just people stomping on you and you're just kind of at the bottom thinking, you know, when will this hell end? So being in Honduras required me to make a few uh, adjustments to my game plan. Uh, I noticed that everyone was carrying a machete. Even five-year-old boys had, had a machete tucked into their boot lip, into their belt uh, loops. So I just uh, had Wicho run by the local hardware store with me and picked up an ax, hickory handle, $23. Canadian, took a picture, sent it to my friend, the CEO, the mogul of the mine and said, expense report for the day. And every day I would just send him a different one. And so one, one day was a bottle of tequila. One was disco lights. Another one was uh, all the scraps of meat in the village. That was the happy times. First two days was solving the problem straight up. Um, and what I was faced with was a series of things that were against me. A general manager, it turned out, had done every single thing that would make everyone mad at you in Honduras. He had violated the agreement uh, about refining gold above a certain line in the cloud forest. Uh, the cartel was mad at him because he had developed some sort of addiction, which is typical in the tropics when green goes down, go down too far. Uh, he was a redheaded fellow, this general manager I heard, and uh, not, not good in the heat. And so he was indoors a lot, hadn't made any friends. He uh, had barricaded himself in the mine because all the workers were doing a strike, a procession around the walls, which were barricaded. And so that's what we found when we went up the, up the mountain the next day in a very underpowered diesel. I had to get out of it, uh, holding my axe and jog alongside because I was, I was too big to allow the truck to progress up the steep gradient, which is had kind of serrated edge surface. On the way back into the truck, I smashed my shin. So I was uh, a limping man as we got to the top and saw 600, 700 workers just walking around and around holding a statue, statuette of a, of a of saint that had been discovered in a field 300 years ago in Honduras and had since become the patron saint. And they were, they were chanting in a, a language, I think it was called Chechua, that, that 
that um, how evil the general manager was inside that mine and how they would never work for him again because of the things he had done to anger both the Virgin Mary and this saint. So I left WeChat to talk to them and uh, understand exactly what their grievances were. I just used my ax to hook over the barbed wire, just like I was uh, a lighty getting over barbed wire and to play uh, sport on the weekends when the school was locked up. And over you go um, and land on your bashed shin. And so I'm looping heavily, holding an ax through very heavy grass on the way to the mining shack, to the offices of the mining, when the general manager comes out and sees me, what do you think? What do you think when you're a guy that far from home and you've done so many things to anger uh, both the suppliers and the distributors and the uh, authorities and the jefes and the alcaldes and uh, the entire uh, power structure and you're barricaded in there with all your misdeeds around you all the artifacts of your crimes and misdemeanors are around you. And you see a guy like me walking towards you, limping, carrying an ax with uh, not just anger in my eyes, but extreme annoyance because of what it felt like to be, be, to be me at that moment. Uh, that interrogation went really quickly just because it was, it was set up. And when you're on the road, first of all, you don't have all the things you're used to having. You gotta make do. Second, you gotta make a really strong entrance. You cannot start a match far, far from home in a bad way. Uh, third, you gotta do what you gotta do to be good with the authorities. So after I understood exactly what the general manager, that ginger man had done to make everyone upset, I went on an apology tour. I literally walked to every single one of those people with my ax. I talked to the cartel, I talked to the mayor, I talked to the real mayor. I talked to the guy from the government that was in charge of mines, which is called the Minister of Mines. And, uh, and then I just went down that list. Then I threw a huge party at the end because the mine was operational again. We had won and I was magnanimous in victory. So even though it was funding from my client, uh, wonderful expense reports there of a party, a gazebo, funding of uh, better funding of the orphanage, and a uh, better town square beautification. We made sure everyone was happy. Uh, when you're a tour on tour, you've got to be a good tourist to the locals, to the president of the union of that part that of that rugby um, club in Uruguay. Uh, spend time like uh, like the box do nowadays. You know, spend time with local communities, Maori villages and understand what a haka means for real. Get yourself into it. Um, for five days in Honduras, I lived and breathed the cloud forest. Uh, in the morning, I would just get up and walk around to understand more because you never really know who's gonna tell you. Maybe it's the groundskeeper in Montevideo who's gonna give you a little secret, because why not? He's actually interested in talking to you that you're from South Africa and that you're playing them the next day. Um, you never really know. Gather and tell without saying, but will this help me? Uh, don't be tied to your creature comforts, you know, the way the slip of your laptop fits with your plug, with your adjustment, with your uh, adapter at home. Dig in. So I was able to open a gold mine in Honduras. I got my knuckles bruised. I mean, there was blood on my skin by the end. And I had to take some things I didn't want. But in the end, I was able to uh, call my friend, my client in Canada, First of all, curse him for making me go down there after agreeing to a rate that he knew was low, um, even if I added danger pay. Um, but he was so proud of the fix. I was so proud of myself for winning. And uh, nothing about that job was on a platter. When you tour, when you play away, go in with that mindset that you're gonna be like water, finding your level. It doesn't matter where it goes. Or what actually solves the problem. It turns out for me, an ax and an apology was super important. For you, it might be um, the way you handle high kicks and the way you address the referee. Honduras is the ultimate away game for a fixer. Everything stacked against me. The hardest commercial landing in the, the, in the whole world to that airport. When you're away games, become a great rugby team. These are confessions of a rugby fixer. 
every week. Uh, and don't ever believe that you're out of a game until it's done.